Carnival. This is a staging citizenship lecture by me, Andrew Thomas, at Erstfell University College, which I would like you to watch before Thursday, the 18th of February, um, 2021. So if you've got a little tired of all the rituals and performatives that seem unavoidable, that structure our social life and um, which just have to happen if you um, want to take part in the social life in a full way, if you want to use your money, if you want to be able to promise people things and be sincere, then you've got to use these rituals and performatives and there's nothing you can do about that. Um, then, um, then maybe you are ready to study the carnival, um, because today is Mardi Gras, or Pancake Day in my tradition, uh, which is the last day of partying before Lent when people start starving themselves. Uh, you eat up all the food in the house or in the, um, in the storage um, so that you've got nothing left to, um, to tempt you during the hunger gap until the, start, until the harvest of the spring starts bringing in its new fruits and vegetables. Um, and its and its form is very familiar from European history. Um, there are there are lots of different um, festivals that we could call something like a carnival. Like I say, we've got Mardi Gras. Maybe that's familiar to you. Um, the Feast of Fools is also a familiar um, medieval festival um, when um, children would take on the um, would take on the the rule of the day. Um, the, the children would um, perhaps be the lord of misrule and they would make the decisions and the bishops who usually would be the ones presiding over religious um, festivals would be the ones who would have to do what the children say. Um, so things are turned upside down um, and obviously there are lots of different forms and we should probably distinguish between Saturnalia and the Feast of Fools and Mardi Gras um, but let's just pretend that there is a common um, shape to all of them and think about what happens when uh, when you when the rules go on holiday like this and, and, and when you you do break all the rules um, and, and a lot of thinkers today um, love this idea this Feast of Fools this institutionalized contingency. So if um, if you've been thinking that performatives and rituals are set in stone, then you're not alone. Um, it's it's quite normal to think that the only way of, um, of, of running a society is the way that I've been um, used to, the one that I've seen all my life, the ones that we got used to. And, um, and, and if you do think that's the only way a society can and should be ruled, um, just like a lot of people tend to, then the Feast of Fools is like um, a, a change of scene, um, like an inspiration um, to to do things differently. Um, the idea that um, life could be different, um, and and we don't have to accept all the rules that we've got today. And that's why um, theorists of society have have loved the idea of the Feast of Fools. And there's been a wonderful book by Harvey Cox, for example, called The Feast of Fools, in which he celebrates this um, this whole thing. The point is um, our mode of society is contingent. It doesn't have to be this way. Now, there is another um, theory of, um, of the Feast of Fools, an interpretation, um, saying that the Feast of Fools, far from actually tempting people or, um, or trying to persuade people to think differently about society, on the contrary, um, the Feast of Fools is a safety valve. It's the um, people get the opportunity to do things differently, specifically so that they will go back to doing things the same way the rest of their time. Um, the criticism says something like um, an exception that everybody knows is an exception uh, merely confirms the established order. And that's why Taylor Swift says wisely, I think, never give anyone excuse to call you crazy because crazy, however much people might say they love it, it's also crazy. They're going to carry on treating you as crazy. And specifically, um, we can say that madness and, um, and, and the crazy um, parties of the Feast of Fools and Carnival um, are given one day to, um, to exercise. But, um, but because that is the one day in which that happens, the rest of the time you can say, well, we don't do that on Ash Wednesday. We don't do that on all Saints Day and all the other days, because the behaviour that you're talking about now, the um, radical um, um, interrupting um, and um, Saturnalian craziness of um, challenging um, political power and turning things upside down, stuff that we would perhaps associate with revolution, or at least revolt, um, they would say, well, we don't do that because that's what you do on Mardi Gras. Um, we've got a space for that. And it's Mardi Gras. As long as it's not Mardi Gras, 
well, you've got to toe the line. You've got to obey the rules and you've got to respect the bishop and you've got to respect the king and you've got to respect the world order. So uh, on that theory, which is the theory of um, Eco, who's very inspired by Bakhtin, uh, Mikhail Bakhtin, the Russian thinker, um, in his book Rabelais and His World, um, um, on that theory, the um, Feast of Fools is not transgressive and revolutionary at all. On the contrary, it's a conservatory. Um, it's a con conservationist thought. Um, it, it keeps things in order by just releasing the tension once every year. Now, I rather think there is, um, there, is, there is more to be said about this, but that does seem to be the debate, in the literature at least. There are some people that are saying Feast of Fools are inspiring, and some people that are saying, no, they're just a safety valve. I rather think that um, we could look at the Feast, um, the Feast of Fools as a practice in democracy, um, but an allowed practice in democracy. And we know lots of stories about allowed practices of democracy. For example, the, the free speech of the clown um, in medieval society, which died out around the Renaissance period, um, um, when the, the clown is allowed to just say anything, anything which, is, um, which comes into the clown's head, but even if it's really offensive. And we, of course, have similar practices in um, comedy roasts, when the friends um, of the person in question um, are gathered and they're allowed to um, be as cruel as they like to the person who is being roasted. It's, um, there's a contract going on. Famously, um, this, is a, this is a statue from um, Corinth. Um, the, the most famous philosopher who was allowed to say whatever he liked was Diogenes the Cynic. Um, and when Alexander the Great, the guy standing up here, um, um, went past uh, with his massive military procession, um, Diogenes, who was just living in his barrel, um, um, Alexander the Great accepted that Diogenes could say anything, even, even insulting things, to this great commander of the whole world. Um, he, was, he, he showed his glory, he showed his emperor uh, imperial power by not getting offended because um and, 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 and he offered to reward diogenes and he said i will give you anything you like because i'm i'm the emperor i'm alexander um what can you possibly request of me and diogenes says get out of my light um because alexander was blocking the sun um and and this says something about the power of both of them alexander showed his grandeur by um tolerating um, freedom of speech and Diogenes showed his grandeur by not actually needing anything, not needing all this um, pomp and ceremony that Alexander had, not needing all his power and all his riches and all his political might. Um, and, and the word the word the Greeks would have used in this time in the 300s to describe this freedom of speech, paresia, um, de described by Michel Foucault in, um, in, in the past few decades, about 1981. Um, 1983, around there, um, is also used in antiquity to describe the freedom of speech that a citizen has in their home country. So on the one hand, it's the freedom of speech which is allowed to a philosopher and which a philosopher has built up his kind of inspired and disciplined cheekiness. Um, but on the other hand, it's something that we should all aspire to as democratic citizens. The problem, of course, is if this freedom of speech is only restricted to one person like Diogenes or one day like Mardi Gras. So, um, and of course, this particular freedom of speech, um, the allowed freedom of speech, is very much in the hands of the person who allows it. Um, and so on the one hand, it looks like we are de um, demonstrating our democratic power by exercising our free, um, freedom of speech. But if it is this contractual freedom of speech, allowed freedom of speech, then, um, then really we are in the hands of the totalitarian ruler, just like Alexander could have just turned around and chopped off Diogenes' head. So the question about, um, about Mardi Gras and the question of carnival is um, at, at, at base something like the question of um, how much freedom do you want? Um, is it okay to have political leaders? And are we perhaps living in a totalitarian era, um, era when we are only allowed to um, exercise our freedom once every four years? Um, is the freedom of speech purely restricted to the political class um, if, um, and, and the journalist class, for example, if I can say something, um, but nobody listens to me? 
Mardi Gras is famously followed by Ash Wednesday, which is tomorrow, the time of discipline um, and fasting. And, and the typical expression of discipline before the monastic disciplines, before the, um, the monastic orders were set in stone was two um, disciplined um, monks or nuns came together to discuss the question, how should we live? So perhaps we should celebrate Ash Wednesday rather than Mardi Gras as our democratic ideal. Um, Ash Wednesday, which is, after all, the patient, attentive, creative expression of justice.